Hello and welcome to this session. In this session, we've been looking at the uh, kidney anatomy. We've looked at renal failure, and this is a continuation or a remedy to the kidney failure. Guys, have you ever wondered if someone has a kidney failure, he's unable to remove the waste. So how can these patients be he helped or assisted? So in this case, uh, the answer to these questions forms the basis of our discussion today. So today we are looking at dialysis. Dialysis is just the treatment of people whose kidneys are failing. Remember when kidneys do fail, it means the kidneys will not be able to filter the blood the way they should be. So as a result, waste and toxins are going to accumulate in your bloodstream. So dialysis does the work of your kidneys. That is removing the waste products and excessive fluid from the blood. So we can uh, generally define dialysis as a medical procedure used to remove waste products and excessive fluids from the blood when the kidneys are unable to perform the functions adequately. And there are two major types of dialysis. You can either have hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. On hemodialysis, we find that here, extract of toxic waste from the blood are removed from the blood, from the body, um, circulating it, th it through a purifying dialyzer, and then returning it into the blood. Our uh, dialysis, uh, hemodialysis, helps restore and maintain the balance of the body's buffer system, electrolyte level, and promoting rapid return to normal serum values and preventing uremia-associated complications. So for long-term treatment, we normally have various access sites, including the AV, that is the atriovenous uh, fistulas or grafts may be used. Hemodialysis requires vascular access, which can either be temporary or permanent. The site and the type of access normally depends on the expected duration of dialysis, the, the surgeon's preference, and the patient's condition. So, we normally have the central venous access, and the central venous access you can be able to see on my diagram on the left side, where we have blood to the dialysis machine. Okay, uh, we have it. The tube is red, and blood from the dialysis machine is blue, so it goes back to the right atrium of the heart, where it's going to be pumped back to the lungs for oxygenation, and it can be returned to the heart to be pumped to the rest of the body parts. So, central venous access, we normally use the Seglina technique, where the surgeon will insert and introduce a needle into the right internal jugular vein. So a guide wire is then inserted through that introducer needle and the needle is removed. So using this guide wire, the surgeon will now uh, make some threads of about 12.5 to 30.5 centimeters, could be plastic or the Teflon uh, catheter into the patient's vein. Another large vein such as the external jugular vein or the femoral nerve uh, the vein could be used. The subclavian vein should be avoided and the simple reason is just to prevent the subclavian vein stenosis and thrombo thrombosis. So central venous access is usually used temporarily when hemodialysis must be started either immediately or the patient does not have a functional AV fistula or graft. So this access may be used long term if the patient has problems maintaining an AV fistula or the graft. So don't be surprised when you see a patient with the central venous, okay? It could be because of the reasons we have stated before. Looking at the fistula, so in order to create a fistula, the surgeon makes an incision in the patient's wrist or the lower forearm and then makes two additional incisions so that we will have one on the side of the artery and another one on the side of the vein. So the edges of this incision are then sutured together to make a common opening of around three to five millimeters long. So the minimal time for maturation of an AV fistula is usually one month, but several studies and guidelines have recommended longer times, preferably between six to 12 months. So thus, it is recommended that a fistula 
could be created before hemodialysis is necessary so that the fistula has matured by the time this patient needs this process. All right? Okay, we can be able to see that. On looking at the AV graft, you know, to create a graft, the surgeon normally makes an incision in the patient's forearm, upper arm, or the thigh. So a synthetic graft is then tunneled under the skin and the distal end is sutured to an, an, uh, to an artery, whereas the proximal end to a vein. All right. So remember, to an artery is what is going to be uh, bringing the blood to the dialyzer. And to the vein, the proximal one, this is the one that is going to take blood back to the right atrium where it is going to be pumped to the lungs for oxygenation before it's returned back to the heart for uh, distribution. We have several indications of hemodialysis. One of the most common one is acute kidney injury abbreviated as ACI. So we have severe impairment of the kidney function due to sudden and reversible causes. End stage uh, renal disease, where the kidney have permanently lost their function, okay? Or the GFR is usually less than 15, okay? We could also have hemodialysis because of the presence of symptoms like nausea, vomiting, fatigue, confusion, due to what we normally refer to as the uremic toxicity. Another reason why we could have um, hemo uh, hemodialysis is if the patient is having hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is simply elevated potassium levels. Remember, the normal range is between 3.5 to 5.0 or 5.1. So we could also have other electrolyte disturbances, but this is the major one. We also have another problem where we have severe fluid overload. Could have also toxins or drug overdose, intra intractable acidosis, where we have buildup of acids in blood where the kidney cannot adequately excrete them. Or somebody could even be having severe hypertension that is very difficult to control and it's causing organ damage. Such could be a candidate for this hemodialysis. Okay, correct guys. Looking at complication, we have three major complications. You could have cardiac perforation. Remember the process, okay, uh, where you find that, uh, of, of course, this is a rare complication, but it is where the dialysis catheter penetrates the heart or a major blood vessel, leading to bleeding or other cardiac issues. So the patient will present with chest pain, hemodynamic instability, and signs of cardiac tamponade, which may be observed. In this case, the treatment is that the patient will require immediate medical attention, including removal and repositioning of the catheter and potential surgical intervention to address the perforation. We have another complication. We refer to it as the chylothorax, and this one occurs when the chyme, this is lymphatic fluid, leaks into the pleural space, often as a result of thoracic duct injury during catheter placement. So the patient will present with dyspnea, difficulty in breathing, chest pain, and signs of respiratory distress. Treatment will usually involve drainage of the chyme and the possible pleuderesis, addressing the underlying cause such as catheter reposition or repair. Lastly, we have the catheter uh, could in unintentionally be placed in an incorrect position, which could lead to inadequate dialysis or complication. This one we normally refer to as misplaced line. So as a result, the patient will present with the poor blood flow during dialysis, difficulty in removing the fluids, and signs of infection at the catheter site. So we need a confirmation of the catheter placement through imaging studies. And also if misplaced, we need to reposition the catheter and obtain a new, a new, a new one. Generally guys, several studies have been carried about just looking at the common complication during dialysis and the majority of them rank hypertension at about uh, 25 to 60% of treatment session, patient will uh, present with hypertension. Thus, it means when somebody is supposed to undergo such a process, withhold all drugs that are likely to cause hypertension, like the cardiovascular drugs, guys. Uh, we also have cardiac arrhythmias in patients of about 5 to 60%, cramps, nausea and vomiting, backache, uh, um, 
we have equal percentage uh, of patients presenting with problems with the back pain and the chest pain. Then you have um, around 1% to 5% itching and few of about 1% presenting with fever. So how is the procedure done for hemodialysis? You know, you have to have support the access site and rest it on a clean rep. You monitor the vital signs throughout hemodialysis at least an, an hourly or, or as often as every 15 minutes according to the facility protocol. Of course, you avoid unnecessary handling of the hemodialysis tubing, and this is just to maintain sterility. You perform periodic tests for clotting uh, time on blood samples and samples from the dialyzer. Give necessary drugs during dialysis unless the drug uh, will be removed by the dialysis procedure itself. So you use a sterile technique for accessing the catheters and use the PPEs, including the gloves, the gown, uh, the mask with a face shield, or have the, have the patient put on a mask. Okay. Before beginning hemodialysis with a double lumen catheter, you need to identify the red and the blue pots, okay? You clamp the catheter to prevent air from entering either lumen of the catheter, remove the cups, and then disinfect the catheter hubs using a new disinfectant uh, pad for each hub. Then you scrub the sides, okay, and the end of each hub thoroughly using friction, making sure to remove any residue. Then you continue disinfecting the catheter limbs using friction, moving from each hub to at least several centimeters towards the patient's body. Hold the Catheter limbs, where they say disinfectant dries, don't allow the catheter hubs to touch and sterile uh, surfaces. So you, while you are maintaining the sterility of this syringe tip, you need to attach a syringe to the red pot and unclamp the pot, withdraw, locking the solution. This one minimizes blood loss. So clamp the pot and discard the syringe. Remember to perform a vigorous mechanical scrub of the red port catheter for at least five seconds using an antiseptic pad. Then allow it to dry completely. So while maintaining the sterility of the, the syringe tip, you need to attach around a 10 mil prefilled syringe containing a preservative free normal saline solution to the rod, uh, to the, to the rod port. Then you unclamp the port and then gently instill the solution, then reclamp the red pot, leaving the syringe attached. So while maintaining sterility of the syringe tip again, attach a syringe to the blue pot and then unclamp the pot. Withdraw the locking solution. Minim this one is just helps to minimize blood loss. Then clamp the pot and then discard the, the syringe. So before uh, beginning, of course, we are uh, uh, proceeding, you need to perform a thorough mechanical uh, scrub of the blue pot uh, catheter hub for at least five seconds using antiseptic pad. Then you allow it to dry completely. But while maintaining the sterility of the syringe tip, you need to attach a 10 millimeter prefilled syringe containing a preservative free normal silence to the blue pot and clamp the pot and then gently instill the solution, then reclamp the blue pot, leaving the syringe attached. Remove the syringe from the red pot and then maintain a sterile technique. Attach the red pot to the line leading to the arterial port of the the dialyzer. The, the then you remove the syringe from the blue pot and then you, um, while maintaining the sterility, you attach the blue pot to the line leading to the venous pot of the dialyzer. Then you now need to now trace the tubing from the patient to its point of origin to prevent misconnect, misconnections. So secure the tubing to the patient to reduce tension on the, on the connections to prevent trauma to the catheter insertion site. Open the clamps to the arterial and venous dialyzer tubing. Begin hemodialysis according to the facility protocol. As, as, try to assess the AV access for patency. Check the quality of the thrill and also auscultate for a breach. Okay, so check for the presence of the swelling, edema, erythema, or drainage. Flush the fistula needles using attached uh, syringes containing heparinized saline solution, and then set them aside. Place a fluid impermeable pad under the patient's arm. 
So using a sterile technique, okay, clean around 8 to 8 by 25 centimeters area of the skin over the fistula with antiseptic pads according to the manufacturer's instructions. Then you apply a tonicet around the fistula. This is just to distend the veins and then facilitate vena puncture. This avoids occluding the fistula. So you put on the clean gloves, you remove the fistula needle guard, and then squeeze the wingtips firmly together. You need to insert now the arterial uh, needle at 45 degrees angle, at least 2.5 centimeters above the anastomosis, being carefully not to puncture the fistula. Then remove the tourniquet and clamp the tubing, then aspirate blood. So once blood is returned, you flush the needle with a flush uh, solution according to the practitioner's order or using a saline flush solution. So clamp the arterial uh, needle tubing, then secure the wingtips of the needle to, to the skin with an adhesive tape. All right. So you perform another vein puncture using the venous uh, needle of uh, a few inches above the arterial, uh, arterial needle. Remove the fistula needle guard, then squeeze the wing tips uh, firmly together. You need to insert the venous needle at 45 degree angle just as you did for the arterial and then being careful not to puncture the fistula. The fistula is what we are worried of. So you release now the tourniquet and then unclamp the tubing and then aspirate blood. Once blood has returned, you flush the needle with the flush solution according to the practitioner's order or use saline flush solution. Remember to clamp the venous uh, needle tubing and then secure the wing tips of the needle to the skin with adhesive tape. Remove the syringe from the end of the arterial tubing, then uncap the arterial line from the hemodialysis machine, and then using a sterile technique, connect the two lines. So tap the connection securely to prevent separation during the a procedure, then remove the syringe from end of the venous tubing, uncamp the venous, um, the venous line from the hemodialysis machine, then using this sterile technique so as not to introduce any microorganism, you connect the two lines. You tap the connection securely and release the clamp and start hemodialysis. So how do you discontinue the hemodialysis when you are using this double lumen catheter? You just need to clamp the catheter lumens to prevent air from entering the catheter. Then you disinfect all the connection points between catheter hubs, lines with the, the uh, and lines using a separate antiseptic pad for each connection to reduce the risk of infection. You disconnect the dialysis line from the red port of the catheter and thoroughly disinfect the hub with a new disinfectant pad. You scrub the sides um, and, and end of the hub thoroughly using friction, making sure to remove any residue. Then you allow the disinfectant to dry. Okay, guys, a link will be popping up on the differences between disinfectant and antiseptic. So while maintaining the sterility of the syringe tip, you attach a 10 mil pre-filled syringe containing preservative free normal saline solution to the red catheter pot. You unclamp the catheter lumen and then slowly flush the lumen. You clamp the catheter lumen, then remove and discard the syringe. Remember to perform a vigorous mechanical drab of the uh, scrub of the catheter hub for about five seconds using an antiseptic pad, then allow it to dry completely. So while maintaining sterility of the syringe tip, you attach a syringe to the red pot containing the, the prescribed locking solution and clamp the catheter lumen and then lock the pot following unit protocol. Clamp the catheter lumen and remove and discard the syringe. So thoroughly disinfect the red pot. Uh, remember the red pot was the one that was uh, getting the blood from the body to the dialyzer. So you, you, you disinfect this one with a disinfectant pad using friction, then allow it to dry. You cap the pot with a new sterile uh, lure lock cap. Then disconnect the dialysis line from the blue from the blue catheter port. And then the blue, remember, it's the one that is returning blood from the dialyzer back to the body, back to the right atrium, okay? So you disinfect the hub 
with a new antiseptic pad, then scrub the sides and the end of the hub thoroughly using friction, making sure to remove any residue, allow the disinfectant to dry. While maintaining the sterility of this syringe tip, I'll attach a 10 ml syringe containing preservative free normosaline solution to the blue catheter uh, pot and clamp the catheter lumen and then slowly uh, flush the lumen. You need to clamp the catheter lumen. Perform a vigorous mechanical scrub of the catheter hub for at least 5 seconds using the antiseptic pad, then allow it to dry completely. While maintaining the sterility of this Syringe tip, attach a syringe to the blue pot containing the prescribed locking solution and lock the pot following unit protocol. Clamp the catheter lumen. Thoroughly disinfect the blue pot with a disinfectant pad using friction, then allow it to dry. Cap the pot with a new sterile lower lock and then redress the catheter side per the facility protocol then you now need now to turn the blood pump on the immobilizer machine to about 50 to 100 mils uh, per liter per, min per minute put on the clean gloves and then remove the tape from the connection side of the arterial lines clamp the needle uh, tubing and disinfect the lines the blood in the machine's arterial line will continue to flow towards the dialyzer, so followed by a column of air. So just before the blood reaches the point where the normal saline solution enters the line, you need to clamp the blood line with another hemostat. So and clamp the normal saline solution to allow a small amount of uh, flow through the line. Then you unclamp the, uh, unclamp the clamp on the machine line to allow all blood to flow into the dialyzer where it passes through the filter and back to the patient through the venous line. After the blood is tra re-transfused, you clamp the venous uh, needle tubing and the machine's venous line and then turn off the blood pump. You remember to remove the tape from the connection side of the venous li uh, lines and disconnect the lines. Remove the venous needle and apply pressure to the site with a folded 4x4 four four inch gauze pad until all the blood stops, usually within 10 minutes. Okay, apply a sterile dry dressing, then repeat the procedure on the arterial line. You remember to disinfect and rinse the delivery system according to the manufacturer's instructions. So what happens in the pre-treatment care? for a patient who is to undergo hemodialysis. You need to prepare hemodialysis equipment following the manufacturer's instruction and facilities protocol. So to avoid pyogenic reactions and bacteremia, which uh, with septicemia, use strict sterile uh, technique while preparing the machine, initiating the treatment and terminating the treatment. If required by your facility, you need to confirm that informed consent has been obtained and that the signed consent form is in the patient's medical record. You need to test the dialyzer and dialysis machine for residue disinfectant after rinsing and then test all the alarms. You need to maintain strict sterile uh, technique to prevent introduction of pathogens into the patient's uh, bloodstream. If the patient is undergoing hemodialysis for the first time, explain the procedure. Remember to wear appropriate PPE during all the procedures. You get weigh the patients and you record the weight. You remember to also to compare the current weight to the weight after the last dialysis and target weight. Record the baseline vital signs, including temperature, taking both sitting and standing blood pressure, auscultate the heart for the rate, rhythm, abnormalities, then assess for edema, observe for respiratory rate, rhythm, quality, and check mental status. Assess the catheter insertion site for signs of infection such as purulent drainage, inflammation, and tenderness. Then assess the condition and patency of the access site. Need to auscultate for a bruit, remember? Auscultate for bruit and palpate for a thrill. This is just used to confirm the patency before beginning and periodically throughout the procedure. You need to notify the, the practitioner if the bruit or the thrill is absent, okay? Because this could uh, show that there is a compromise or the clot formation for this patient and this is an emergency. 
Assess uh, circulation in the in the location of the access uh, access site by assessing pulses, capillary refill, and color and temperature of the extremities. You check for the problems since last dialysis and evaluate previous the laboratory data. Help the patient into a comfortable position. It could be supine or sitting in a recliner with uh, the feet elevated. There is a link will be popping up on how to put a patient in supine position and also on a recliner position. Okay? So obtain the blood samples from the patient as ordered before uh, beginning hemodialysis and then evaluate the results. You label all these medications, um, medication containers and other solutions on and off the sterile field. Then immediately report uh, machine malfunction or equipment uh, defect. Okay. In post or after care treatment, after the dialysis, if bleeding continues after removing the AV fistula needle, you need to use a sterile gauze pad to apply just enough pressure to stop the bleeding. You need to monitor the patient's vital signs according to the patient's uh, the, the, the facilities protocol and also compare with the, these pre-dialysis findings. Then evaluate post-treatment laboratory values. Remember to weigh the patient and record the weight. Then compare it with this pre-treatment weight. Observe the patient for adverse effects of treatment. You need to assess the catheter insertion site for signs of infection. It could be virulent drainage, it could be inflammation or tenderness. Provide emotional support to the patient and family. And then complication during and after the procedure could include um, sepsis, or pinch of syndrome and, and bleeding. So teaching sh should be family-centered. So you need to be sure that the family and the caregiver understand. So you teach the patient and the family how to take care of this access site at home. You need to tell the patient to notify the healthcare provider if there is pain, swelling, redness, drainage that occurs in the, this accessed arm. And if the patient experiences shortness of breath, dyspnea, fever, chills, headache, nausea, vomiting, itching, constipation or diarrhea, confusion for that matter, or trouble concentrating, hand weakness or numbness, insomnia, dry mouth, loss of sex drive or erectile dysfunction. All these are complications that have to be reported to the practitioner. You need to provide a telephone number for the dialysis center so that the patient can call in case they encounter such. Remind the patient not to allow any treatment or procedure on the accessed arm, including blood pressure measuring. It should be done on the opposite hand. Tell the patient to avoid putting excessive pressure on the arm. So the patient shouldn't sleep on it. They shouldn't wear the uh, constrictive uh, clothing or jewelry over it, or even lift heavy items or strain it, okay? So while healing, you need to keep the arm straight and elevated as directed by the practitioner. It's also important to avoid getting it wet for several hours after dialysis. So the patient can also ask the dialysis care team to rotate the size for needle access in future. You need also to review the dialysis schedules with the patient and family so that you make sure that they are aware of their next scheduled treatment. Treatment usually takes about three to five hours and can be done each other day or three times a, a week. We prefer the alternate days. Re review the fluid and diet restrictions as needed, which may include limiting fluids, uh, foods and beverages high in phosphorus or sodium. In addition, you need to stress the importance of monitoring the amount of potassium and protein in the diet. You instruct the patient to take all the medication as prescribed. The catheter dressing should remain clean and dry. So if the dressing needs changing at home or between the treatments, an emergency dressing kit should be available for the patient. The catheter should never be left open to air, so the graft and the fistula should always be cleaned each day before dialysis with antibacterial soap. The patient should be reminded not to pick the, the, the scab or scratch the skin. Instruct the patients to never allow blunt measuring to be performed on the arm with the graft. Instead, it should be done on the opposite. So dear patient, 
your healthcare provider has ordered hemodialysis for you. So as the patient uh, who is due for this procedure, this procedure uses a dialyzer to do your kidney's job. So by filtering your blood through its internal membranes, it will remove extra fluids and impurities and retains purified blood to your body. So before the dialysis, the nurse and the dialysis technician will weigh you and measure your blood pressure. Of course, on the opposite arm, on the opposite arm, you avoid the arm with the graft, guys. Once you, you we will do it now twice. That is one when you are standing and another one when you are seated. So before the first treatment, you will have a temporary dialysis uh, catheter placed on your chest or a permanent dialyzer access surgically created in your arm. So the, patient, the nurse will connect you to the machine and turn it on and begin the treatment and will check the dialyzer and the connection frequently. Could be every 15 minutes, okay? So during dialysis, the nurse will check your blood pressure every 15 to 30 minutes as well as collect blood samples occasionally before hemodialysis and possible when it ends. So the blood, these blood samples will be tested to see how well dialysis is working for you. Before, uh, be sure to tell the, the nurse how you feel, especially if you experience headache, dizziness, backache, nausea, vomiting, muscle twitching, difficult breathing, muscle cramps, or pain. This could be complications associated with hemodialysis. So when hemodialysis is over, the nurse will disconnect the tube from the dialyzer. After dialysis, remember to tell the patient this one, so when you go home, remember to keep the skin around the dialysis catheter or surgically created access clean and dry. If the nurse has to has, has taught you how or how to clean the, the, this place daily until so you need to do it daily until healing is complete and the stitches are removed. You need to call your healthcare provider. If you experience the complication we have listed above, so if you have a surgically created access, you check for a pulse every day. So if the, the pulse will indicate that the blood is freely moving through the dialysis access, so you will not be able to check the blood flow if you have a catheter in your in your chest. All right. So from there, guys, we, we, we can be allowed to look at the next uh, treatment, and that is peritoneal dialysis and peritoneal dialysis it requires insertion of a peritoneal catheter such as the technical catheter to circulate dialysate in the peritoneal cavity so here the practitioner normally inserts a catheter with the patient the patient could be under ga or or, or the local anesthesia and then sutures it in place and then tunnels the distal portion subcutaneously to the skin surface there, it serves as a port for the dialysis solution. So the solution is still into the peritoneal cavity through the catheter, which normally draws waste products, excessive fluids, and electrolytes from blood across the semipermeable peritoneal membrane. So after a prescribed period, the dialysis normally drains into the peritoneal, peritoneal cavity. All right? So comparing the peritoneal dialysis catheter, first we have to know that the first step in any type of peritoneal uh, dialysis of, is insertion of a catheter to enable installation of the dialysate solution. So the practitioner may insert one of the three catheters that we are going to mention. The first one is the technical catheter. Okay, you can be able to see it on my left, okay, on my right, that is, I mean. So, to implant this technical, um, the, the technical catheter, the doctor will insert the first 17 centimeters of this catheter into the patient's abdomen. Then the practitioner will subcutaneously embed the next um, 7 centimeter segment, which may have a dandruff uh, curve at one or both ends. All right, here, guys. Then within a few days after insertion, the patient tissues grow around the calves. They form a tight barrier against bacterial infiltration. So the remaining 10 centimeters of the catheter will extend outside the abdomen and it's equipped with a metal adapter at the tip that connects to the dialyzer tubing. 
The second type of catheter is referred to as the flanged collar catheter. So to insert this catheter, the practitioner will position its, uh, its flanged collar just below, just below the dermis so that the device extends through the abdominal wall. So the practitioner keeps this distal end of the calf from extending into the peritoneum where it could cause adhesions. The third one is referred to as the CDPC, that is the column disc peritoneal catheter. It's here on my right here. So to insert this, um, this catheter, the practitioner will roll up the flexible disc section of the implant, insert it into the peritoneal cavity and retract it against the abdominal wall. So the implant's first calf rests just outside the peritoneal membrane its second calf rests just under the skin because the, CDP, uh, the CDPC doesn't float freely in the peritoneal cavity. It keeps inflowing dialysate solution from being directed at sensitive organs, which increases the patient's comfort during dialysis. So how does peritoneal dialysis work? Peritoneal dialysis works through a combination of two processes. It could be diffusion and Osmosis. So in diffusion, particles will move through a semipermeable membrane from an area of high solute concentration to an area of low solute concentration. In peritoneal dialysis, the water-based dialysate will contain glucose, sodium chloride, calcium, magnesium, acetate or lactate, and no waste products. So this causes waste and excessive electrolytes in blood to cross through the semipermeable uh, peritoneal membrane into the dialysate. So removing the waste-feed dialysate and replacing it with fresh solutions keeps the waste concentration low and encourages further diffusion. On number two, Osmosis. In osmosis, fluids move through a semipermeable membrane from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. So in peritoneal dialysis, we have dextrose is added to the dialysate. So this gives it at a higher solute concentration than the blood. This creates a high osmotic gradient. So waste products from the blood through the membrane at the beginning of each infusion, when the osmotic gradient is highest, will be doing so. And this is now explains the two procedures, how it works. So we have the stages of this uh, peritoneal dialysis and we abbreviate it as FIDD. So this is for the first time patient. For the first time patient will be moving uh, from uh, the installation to dwelling and then lastly draining. Okay so the last uh, uh, step for a new patient it will be draining okay remember draining will be the first step for a for a patient who is having a subsequent exchange okay so each solution uh, change is called exchange or a cycle so each, each exchange or cycle will involve phases so during phase one which we are referring to as installation or filling the phase the dialysis infuses through the catheter into the abdominal cavity typically requiring about five to ten minutes for the dialysis to infuse and fill the abdominal cavity so during the dual phase the dialysis remains in the abdominal cavity allowing osmosis and diffusion to occur. So the dwell time varies as prescribed and is also determined by the patient's conditions. If you have more waste in the body, you expect this process to be a bit longer and the delivery method. But typically, uh, most patients, the time will be varying between 30 minutes to 4 hours. The last one is in drain phase, where the dialysis and excessive um, extra cellular fluid, waste electrolytes, will drain from the abdominal cavity via the catheter, typically over 15 to 20 minutes. So if the patient first, is the first time receiving this peritoneal dialysis, we've said that the installation phase is the first one. But for patients who are receiving this therapy, the drain phase must be completed first, followed by installation and then the dwelling phase. So the procedure is indicated for patients with stage 5. Those who have, who have the GFR is less than 15, all right? Um, or earlier stage of kidney disease where signs and symptoms become worse.
So if patients have acute kidney injury, okay, hemodialysis, vascular access, or, or chronic uh, heart failure, coagulation abnormalities, or ischemic heart disease, they can also benefit from peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis gives the patient more independence. It requires less travel time for treatment. It results in more stable fluids and electrolyte levels than the convectional hemodialysis. So because the patient can resume normal activity, normal activities between dialysis solution changes, peritoneal dialysis helps the patient return to the near normal life. Okay, It is also less costly than hemodialysis. So methods of peritoneal dialysis could be manual or automated methods. So the manual method will require a tubing and a bag setup that fills and drains by gravity. While the automated method will require a machine that uses gravity or a pump to drain the dialysis. We have number of contraindications to peritoneal dialysis which include an inability to perform self-care or absence of caregiver to assist with the peritoneal dialysis after discharge. We could also be having a recent major intra-abdominal surgery and severe morbid obesity. This is body mass index above 40. Guys, a link will be popping up on the different BMI levels, okay, and showing the different categories of uh, uh, of the BMI, okay? You can review it, but this for this morbid obesity, this starts at 40, all right? So extra peritoneal procedures such as nephroptomy aren't necessarily contraindication, it's good to know. So contraindication to urgent peritoneal dialysis for acute could include maybe someone having an ileus, appendicitis, a bowel ischemia, intestinal obstruction, or perforation, Bacterial or fungal uh, perinite, uh, peritonitis, new aortic uh, grafts, abdominal and diagrammatic fistulae, abdominal bands, cellulitis, severe hypercatabolic states, and profound metabolic acidosis. You find that the practitioner may insert the peritoneal catheter in operating room or interventional radiology department under sterile condition. Peritoneal dialysis may be performed by a nephrology nurse, acute care hemodialysis nurse, or acute care, hemo, uh, acute care dialysis technician with a nurse supervision. Critical care nurse could also assist expert medical surgical nurse or contracted nurse from an agency who has been trained and is competent to perform peritoneal dialysis. Nurses should know what they are required to do as per their facilities, okay? So that you use the facility protocol where necessary. So in peritoneal dialysis, you need just a scale. You need to monitor the signs of the equipment, uh, or the patient, uh, monitoring equipment, stethoscope, uh, disinfectant part. So to instill and to drain the dialysis, you need a prescribed dialysis solution. So the peritoneal dialysis administration set is usually a closed delivery system with an attached drainage bag, a transfer seat, heating pad or commercial uh, warmer, an IV pole, mask, uh, gloves, the PPEs in general, and then you have the sterile gauze, about 10 by 10 centimeters uh, gauze pads, antiseptic solution, probably the povidone solution, the hypochlorite or the chlorohexidine. We also have the hypoallergic tape or the catheter as a securement device, facility approved dis disinfectant, sterile drips, and optional, we could have a number of items that are optional and not really mandatory. So what about the peritoneal dialysis machine? So this is it's also referred to as a cycler, as we have said, and is a machine that has multiple functions within administration of peritoneal dialysis. So circular function can vary based on the model and the manufacturer, but generally they include warming the fluid, delivering the dialysis using a preset inflow volume, then allowing the dialysis to dwell for a specific period of time using a preset dwell time and allowing for drain cycle using a predetermined volume or time. So the circular uses disposable tubing and can also be set by the patient 
nurse or the caregiver. Some circulars are uh, can communicate with the clinic or the nurse, sharing details of each dialysis session. So you need to follow in, uh, manufacturing instruction for the circular that you are using. So to change the catheter dressing, you need a sterile drip, you need a sterile uh, gauze pads, probably the 10 by 10 centimeters, you need a dressing, masks, hypoallergic tape, antiseptic solution, sterile gloves, and the sterile cap. All right. So in preparation, you need to be able to insert all the equipment and supplies. If the product is expired or is defective or has a compromised integrity, you need to remove it from the patient use. Make sure, remember to label it as a, either expired, either if a, a defective, or re and report this exp expiration or defect as directed by your facility. If the medications are prescribed for the peritoneal dialysis and the pharmacy can't add them into the dialysis solution bag, you have to use a laminar airflow hood, then add them using a sterile technique to prevent bacterial and fungal contamination of the solution bag. Remember to mix this solution by inverting the bag several times. Okay, then after adding the medication, you label the solution, uh, the solution bag with the name and the dose of the medication, the time and the date of ad uh, addition, your initials and whether refrigeration is needed. So you need to warm the dialysis solution bag to keep the body, uh, to ensure that it matches with the body temperature using this dry heat to prevent patient discomfort and abdominal pain. On implementation, you avoid distraction and interruption when preparing and administering the dialysis solution to prevent administration errors. Remember to review the patient's medical records for the primary kidney disease and other comorbid conditions. Response to previous peritoneal dialysis treatment. Also, the medication history, pertinent uh, laboratory uh, test results could be blood urea, nitrogen, severe creatinine, uh, serum creatinine, albumin, uh, bicarbonate, glucose, potassium, hemoglobin levels, hematocrit, white blood cell count, and white and white and platelets count. You need to verify the patient's order, which could include the patient, the number of daily exchanges, the frequency of the exchanges, feed the volume, the dialysis solution type, the dextrose calcium concentration, and the added medication. Then compare the dialysis solution label to the order for the patient's medical uh, record. Also, you need to check the patient's medical record for the allergy contraindication to the prescribed dialysis solution or its addictives. Okay? Then if an allergy or a contraindication exists, don't administer the dialysis solution. Notify the practitioner. Okay? So visually uh, inspect the dialysis for particles, discoloration, or other loss of integrity. Don't administer the dialysis solution if the integrity has been compromised, remember? Always discuss and resolve issues and concerns uh, about the dialysis solution with the patient's practitioner. You gather and prepare the necessary equipment and supplies, perform hand hygiene, confirm the patient's identity using at least two identifiers. It could be the name of the patient together with the date of birth, and then close the door to the room and pull the curtains around the bed. This just helps minimize airborne uh, contaminants. Additionally, it also provides privacy. Also, explain the procedure to the patient and the family, and then according to the uh, to the individual's communication, and then learning needs to increase their understanding. So explaining will also allay their fears and finally enhance cooperation. If the patient previously received peritoneal dialysis, ask the patient's response into the previous treatment, then perform the hand hygiene and assess the patient's respiratory abdominal, st uh, abdominal status Ask the sign. Ask for this. Uh, ask and assess for the signs of dehydration, initial in sample, uh, in, in sensible uh, fluid loss. Obtain the patient's baseline weight in kilograms before initiating peritoneal dialysis therapy. And then weigh the patient daily. Obtain the patient's weight consistently with or without the fluid um, dwelling. Use the same scale. And make sure the patient wears similar clothing to ensure consistency to, for, for accurate weight measurements. Also, remember to clean and disinfect your identified workspace. 
If you are using an automated peritoneal dialysis machine, program this machine as prescribed and according to the uh, manufacturer's instruction for use. For in the installation process, you need to perform hand hygiene. After performing hand hygiene, you raise the bed to the waist level before providing the care. This is going to help prevent caregiver back strain. Okay? Then you position this patient with the head and the upper torso elevated during the dialysate solution and the drainage. If possible, this prevents respiratory compromise when infusing the dialysate and also maximizes the, uh, the, the, the gravity effort when draining the dialysate. Place the patient in a supine position. If the peritoneal dialysis becomes necessary during the first weeks after catheter incision, you also need to perform hand hygiene, hang the dialysate bag on an IV pole, and then connect the peritoneal dialysis administration set to the dialysate. Prime the dialysis administration set tubing with the dialysate to purge the system of air before uh, be, be, because air in the peritoneal in the peritoneum can cause pain and can interfere with the filling. Okay, so clamp the tubing between the dialysate bag and the patients, and then place the drainage bag on this on the on a clean surface below the mid abdominal area, just to facilitate the drainage. Remember to put a mask and help the patient also put on a mask, okay, just to prevent those airborne uh, infections. Then perform hand hygiene and then prepare a sterile field using a sterile drip. Open a sterile container package that could be 10 by 10 gauze pads. I think this one we had mentioned before. Then pour the antiseptic solution into a sterile container or into a gauze pads. So you put on the gloves as needed and other the PPEs, this just helps to comply to the standard precaution. So if present, carefully remove the dressing covering the peritoneal catheter without pulling on the catheter, then you discard the dressing. You check the skin integrity at the catheter exit site and then assess for signs of infection such as purulent drainage, The redness and, the, and, and, and edema. If the drainage is present, notify the, the, the practitioner. Obtain the specimen if ordered as um, using a sterile swab. Put in a specimen container or sterile culture tube with a transport medium. Then you label the specimen in the presence of the patient to, uh, to prevent mis mislabeling. You palpate the catheter exit site and subcutaneous tunnel route for tenderness or pain. If these symptoms occur, you notify the healthcare provider. You remove and discard your gloves, perform the hand hygiene, then put on sterile gloves so that you scrub the catheter cap connection using a gauze pad soaked in antiseptic solution. The antiseptic solution effectiveness depends on the length of the scrub tie. Povidone solution normally requires around two to three minutes, while hypochlorite will require about a minute. And lastly, the chlorohexidine will require 30 seconds. You follow the manufacturer's instruction for the correct disinfectant use. Wrap another antiseptic soaked gauze pad around the distal end of the catheter's setup uh, connection and leave it for about five minutes to reduce the transmission of microbes. Remove and discard the, 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 the used gauze and let the catheter cap connection dry. Remove the cap and wrap another antiseptic soaked gauze pad around the catheter adapter to disinfect the open catheter adapter. Using a sterile technique, you attach the dialysate administration set to the transfer, transfer set. So be sure to secure the lure co uh, connector tightly. Then trace the tubing from the, 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 the patient to its point of origin to make sure that you are connecting the tubing to the proper port. So this is how the proper setup of peritoneal dialysis administration should look like. You can see the dialysate, the administration tubing, 
then you have the catheter, the peritoneal catheter, and then you have the drainage catheter, and then the drainage bag. Kindly take note of how the patient has been positioned in that reclining position, okay? So you need to unclamp the catheter and the dialysis administration set tubing and instill the dialysis as ordered. Alternatively, unclamp the catheter and let the peritoneal dialysis machine instill the dialysis. You monitor the flow of the dialysis, making sure that the, the catheter isn't kinked or occluded. Remove and, dis, uh, and discard the, the, the patient's mask. Also remove the bed to the lowest, uh, return the, be the bed to the lowest position to prevent falls and maintain the patient's safety. Monitor the patient's vital signs as ordered or according to the patient's condition to assess for the signs of hypovolemia. It could be hypotension, tachycardia, and the sudden rise in of the intraperitoneal pressure. Then notify the practitioner if the patient develops hypotension, tachycardia, and abdominal pain. Remember to discard used samples in the appropriate receptacles. Remove and discard your gloves, mask, if worn, or other PPEs. Then perform the hand hygiene. For the dwelling phase, if you are using a manual system, after the dial set infuses, you close the, uh, the clamp on the transfer and set and peritoneal dialysis administration set tubing to make sure that air doesn't enter the patient's peritoneum. If the patient's schedule requires disconnection from the system during the dual phase, you disconnect the patient from the system. You also put on a mask and help the patient put on the mask as well. Perform hand hygiene, then put on the sterile gloves as needed with other uh, the PPEs. Then thoroughly disinfect the catheter connection as directed by the facility or according to the manufacturer's instructions. Use a sterile gauze pad Disconnect the peritoneal dialysis administration set uh, tubing from the transfer set. Then using a sterile technique, you carefully connect the catheter cup to the transfer set. Then secure the catheter to the patient's abdomen. Remove and discard the patient's uh, mask. Remove and discard your gloves, mask, and if one other PPEs, you perform the Hand hygiene. Allow the solution to dwell into the to dwell for the prescribed dwell time. Then explain that the patient may resume normal activities during the prescribed dialysis dwell time. So for the patient, uh, if the patient if the patient was disconnected from the system during the prescribed time, you rec reconnect the peritoneal dialysis catheter to the system and then following the, the attachment steps after the prescribed dwell time elapses. If you are using a manual system, you place the drainage bag below the patient's mid-abdominal area to enhance gravity flow, and clamp the transfer set and drainage bag tubing, and let the drainage flow from the patient's peritoneal cavity. Alternatively, make sure that the peritoneal dialysis machine is functioning according to the drain phase. Assist this patient with the position changes as needed just to facilitate the drainage. Then observe the, of the, of, uh, the appearance of the effluent. The fluid may be bloody or pinky after the catheter insertion, but should clear and become now colorless to yellow, uh, uh, light yellow after the first few exchanges. You need to suspect peritonitis if the fluid is cloudy. So you have to notify the practitioner and obtain a specimen for laboratory testing if ordered. You label the specimen in the presence of the patient just to prevent mislabeling. Then place the specimen in laboratory biohazard transport bag and send it to the laboratory immediately with appropriate laboratory request form. If you are using a manual system, you need to clamp or close the transfer set and then clamp the drainage bag tubing after the peritoneal fluid drains completely. Obtain the weight of the drainage bag or measure the drainage volume as ordered just to ensure adequate drainage and assess intake and output. On completion of the procedure, you perform the hand hygiene, raise the bed to the waist level before be, uh, before providing care just to prevent the caregiver back straight. Then perform hand hygiene. You put on the mask and also help the patient equally have the mask. Then perform the hand hygiene again and then set up a sterile field using a sterile trap. 
we are using a gauze pad of 10 by 10. Then you pour this antiseptic solution into a sterile container or onto the gauze pads. Then you put on the sterile gloves as and as needed other the other the other PPEs. Then disconnect the peritoneal dialysis uh, administration. Set tubing from the transfer set. If required by your facility, disinfect the end of the transfer set. Some facilities don't require catheter disinfection if a new sterile cap is attached to the transfer set. So if you're using a disinfectant containing a disconnect cap, you um, uh, visually inspect the cap just to ensure wetness. With the transfer set pointing down, you attach the cap to the transfer set using the sterile no-touch technique. So using the antiseptic soaked gauze pads, you clean the, the catheter and, and the exit site junction. So following the antiseptic manufacturer's instruction. Then allow them to air dry. Then apply an antibiotic ointment to the catheter exit site if ordered following the safe medication administration practices. Apply a new dressing to the catheter set, uh, site if needed. Then secure a catheter and transfer set to the patient's abdomen using hypoallergic tape or other securement device to prevent accidental dislodgement. Remove and discard the patient mask and then return the bed to the lowest position to prevent falls and maintain patient com comfort. Then you have to now discard the used supplies in the appropriate receptacles. Then remove and discard your gloves, mask, if worn, and other PPEs. Perform hand hygiene, then clean and disinfect your stethoscope with a disinfectant pad. Perform hand hygiene, then document the procedure. For special consideration, you need to change the catheter dressing at an interval determined by your facility or whenever it becomes wet or soil. To prevent protein depletion, the, man, the practitioner will order a high diet, uh, high protein diet or a protein supplement as well as some serum level monitoring. So to prevent respiratory distress, you need to place this patient in a position that maximizes lung expansion. So promote lung expansion through tubing and deep breathing exercise. In some patients, decreasing the dialysate volume may be necessary. If the patient suffers severe respiratory distress during the dual phase of dialysis, you immediately drain the peritoneal cavity and notify the practitioner. Okay? Carefully monitor any patient on peritoneal dialysis who is being weaned from ventilation because this is where complications are likely to occur. The dialysis is normally available in three concentrations. We have the 4.2%, 2.5%, and 1.5% dextrose. You find that the 4.25% solution usually removes the largest amount of fluid from the blood because of its glucose concentration is highest. But you need to be careful so that you monitor the patient who receives this concentration because this, uh, this could lead to a, a, a removal of excess fluid loss, which again may be detrimental to the patient. Also, as some of the 4.2% solution may enter into the patient bloodstream, and this could cause hyperglycemia so severe that it may require an insulin injection or insulin addition to the dialysate. Patient with a low serum potassium level may also require addition of potassium to the dialysate just to prevent further, further losses. It is also common to add heparin to the dialysate to prevent formation of fibrin in the dialysis catheter. So, to reduce the risk of peritone, uh, peritonitis, we normally use strict sterile technique during this, uh, the catheter insertion, dialysis exchange, and dressing changes. We need to ensure that all personnel and the patient wears the mask in the room where you, are, where you open and enter the dialysis system. Also monitor the patient hemodynamic status. Note the patient's fluid balance at the end of each infusion dual drain cycle. The fluid balance is positive if the patient retains fluid at the end of an exchange. And negative if you recover more fluid than you instilled with the exchange. So notify the healthcare provider 
if your patient retains 500 or more fluid for the three consecutive cycles, if the patient loses a liter, okay, or more fluid for three consecutive cycles. If the dialysis ins ins installation or drainage is slow or absent, you check the tube for kinks. You can also try raising the IV pole or repositioning the patient, uh, the patient just to increase the inflow rate. You need to reposition the patient or apply manual pressure to the lateral aspect of the abdomen, which may also increase the drainage. If these maneuvers fail, you have to notify the practitioner. The catheter may improperly pos be positioned or fibrin may be obstructing this catheter. Okay? Always examine the drained fluid. That is the effluent of each excess for color and clarity. Normally, the fluid is clear or pale yellow, but pink tinged effluent may appear during the first three or four cycles. If the effluent remains pink tinged or if it is grossly blood, you suspect bleeding into the peritoneal cavity and notify the practitioner. Also notify the practitioner if the effluent contains feces, this could suggest a bowel perforation or if it's cloudy, this could suggest periton peritonitis. The practitioner should also be notified if the fibrin is present in the fluid so that you obtain a specimen for culture and sensitivity testing and gram test as ordered. You place the specimen in a labeled specimen container, place the container in laboratory biohazard transport, and send it to the laboratory with the laboratory request form. Ex 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 expect the patient uh, ex ex expect patient discomfort at the start of the procedure, but if the patient experiences pain during the procedure, then you, you need to determine when it occurs, its quality, duration, and whether it radiates to other parts of the body, then notify the practitioner. Pain during infusion usually results from dialysis that is too cool or acidic, while pain also may result from rapid installation. So slowing the inflow set may reduce the pain. Severe and diffuse pain with rebound tenderness and cloudy effluent may indicate peritoneal infection. While pain that radiates to the shoulder commonly result from air accumulation around under, under the, the diaphragm. So severe, persistent, uh, peri perineal and rectal pain can result from improper catheter replacement. Remember that a patient undergoing peritoneal dialysis commonly requires a great deal of assistance with daily care. To minimize the patient's discomfort, uh, you need to perform daily care uh, during a drain phase in the cycle and then when the, patient, the abdomen is less distended. During and after dialysis, you need to monitor the patient, including performing abdominal and respiratory assessment and assessing the patient's response to treatment. Also monitor the patient's vital signs according to the patient's condition and at interval determined by your facility. There is no evidence-based research that indicates the best practice for frequency of vital signs. Okay? So notify the healthcare provider of abrupt changes in the patient's condition. So monitor the patient's fluid and electrolyte status. You report an expected result to the practitioner and administer fluids and electrolytes as prescribed. Check whether your facility has a clearly developed curriculum for peritoneal dialysis training. Also support the patients with a potential alteration in body image and ability to live a satisfying lifestyle as peritoneal dialysis patient. Encourage the patient and the caregiver to build and use a viable support system. So guys, if you compare the two, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. You find that hemodialysis is usually performed in a dialysis uh, center or hospital, while the peritoneal dialysis can be performed at home, offering patient uh, flexibility. In terms of the access point, we have vascular access point. It could have an, an AV, that is arteriovenous fistula, a graft, or a catheter for hemodialysis. For peritoneal dialysis, a catheter is normally inserted into the peritoneal cavity. In terms of frequency, hemodialysis is typically done three times a week, each session lasting about uh, two to 
uh, to five hours, okay? Uh, whereas peritoneal dialysis, you have daily exchanges, including overnight automated peritoneal dialysis. In terms of fluid removal, you're saying hemodialysis removes fluid more rapidly, whereas peritoneal dialysis removes fluids gradually. So blood is diverted to an external machine, that is the dialyzer for filtration in hemodialysis, whilst for peritoneal dialysis, the solution is introduced into the peritoneal cavity, so the waste could move across the peritoneal membrane. We have risk for hypotension, muscle cramps, and infection for hemodialysis, whereas the peritoneal dialysis, the risk of peritonitis, hernias, and fluid overload is acknowledged here. Hemodialysis requires a dedicated facility, that is a dialysis center, while peritoneal dialysis can be performed at home, and this allows and gives more independence to our patients. Hemodialysis is, uh, we have scheduled sessions at the center, whereas we have, perit we have daily exchanges done at home, providing flexibility for the peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis may require additional medication for blood pressure management, whereas peritoneal dialysis uh, generally we have better uh, blood pressure control without the need for additional medication. Hemodialysis may be challenging for elderly patients to travel to an, a center, while peritoneal dialysis is more adaptable for the elderly, especially with home-based uh, options. Okay. In terms of comparison, you find that both Hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis both are uh, renal replacement therapies that are used for individuals with kidney problems, okay? And both will remove wastes, okay? We remove wastes and water from, it, uh, from the body. But there's a clear difference where hemodialysis, we may need anticoagulation medications, uh, which is not the case for peritoneal dialysis. But both com in both cases, you have potential complication, you have infection and uh, other issues related to the access sites. Um, it is less common for patients to be performed hemodialysis at home, so it's only done at specialized centers. All right? Okay, guys. So generally, um, uh, general consideration, you're saying that uh, this one, end-stage renal disease, this is where we are going to uh, carry out this procedure, either hemodialysis or um, peritoneal dialysis. So dialysis in general sustains life when the kidney function is severely compromised and it allows for removal of waste and excess, ex excessive, excessive fluids uh, for that matter. So in terms of limitations, it does not fully uh, replicate the functions of natural kidneys. That is something we need to know. And it requires commitment to regular sessions and lifestyle uh, adjustment. So kidney transplant is considered a long-term solution to, for most patients with end-stage renal disease. So dialysis can be performed um, and it also plays a crucial role in the management of kidney failure. So it provides a lifeline for individuals who are awaiting kidney transplantation or for those who are not eligible for transplantation. So that is how uh, the session is. So guys, to wrap up the video, you can easily access the practice quiz in the description section. Uh, we can just uh, click and you'll be able to get practice quizzes for both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Until next time, guys, take care.